بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم أما بعد so this is episode 111 and this is the series on the seer of the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام and in the last few episodes until now alhamdulillah we've been discussing that we need to we've been discussing sorry that we need to social distance while we sit here too but uh, we've been discussing the letters that were written by Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam to the different monarchs, to the different governors, to the different kings during his time. These are events which take place during the seventh year after Hijrah. So Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam's letter that was addressed to Hiraql, who was the king or the emperor of Rome, that was sent by or dispatched with um, Dehya Kalbi radiallahu anhu, and then Najashi radiallahu anhu, to whom Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam had sent his letter with Amr bin Uyayna radiallahu anhu, and then to Mundir bin Sawa, to whom Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam had dispatched his letter via Ala ibn al-Hadrami radiallahu anhu. Mundir was the great one or the king or the monarch of the then known Bahrain. And then, now, today, we discuss Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa dispatching this letter which is written from him to two of the sons of the king or the supreme leader of Amman. The letter, I read it to you in Arabic and then we can translate it to Min Muhammad Abdullahi wa Rasulih ila Jaifar wa Abd ibn Jalandi from Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the messenger of Allah and the slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Jaifar and Abd Jaifar and Abd are the names of the two sons of the king of Amman at that time. The king's name himself, Jalandi. Jalandi's two sons, Abd and Jafar. These are the two to whom Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is addressing in this letter. However, it is possible in one narration we find, Suhaili rahimahullah, a great historian mentions, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had mentioned or addressed him in the letter as well the father who is the supreme leader, the monarch, the great king, or it's just possible that his father had attained or their, uh, their father had attained old age and he had passed down the kingdom to his two sons who were his heirs anyhow while he was still alive. And this is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has addressed the two sons and not the king himself. Salamun ala man al huda. Peace be upon the one who adheres to the truth. When Rasulullah has been addressing these monarchs and kings till now, he has used these words again and again. Salamun ala man al huda. Peace be upon the one who adheres to the guidance, the truth. This is appropriate when we address a non-Muslim or we address anybody in that manner. If we're addressing the Muslim, then salamun ala al-Muslimin. And if we're addressing a non-Muslim, who has not adhered to, who is not following the truth, the haq, then it doesn't apply to them. So it's a vague, it's a very general salam that is being made. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa made this salam in these letters in which he addressed to these kings and monarchs. Salamun ala man al huda. So if you do follow the guidance, peace be upon you. And if not, there's no salam. Amma ba'd. Amma ba'd. You've heard this a lot. You hear it in the khutbahs. You hear it in Jumwa. You hear it is actually the short form for Ba'd al-Hamdi wa thana Now, after having praised Allah and sending salutations upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa let us begin the talk. Amma Ba'd. So you normally you would hear, وَنَشَدُ وَلَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِكُ وَنَشَدُ وَنَّ سَيْدْنَا مَوْلَانَ مُحَمَّدٍ عَبْدُهُ رَسُولُهُ In very, very beautiful different manners and ways. And then after that, the khatib would address, or the people, the masses, Amma Ba'd. In other words, let us get to the topic now. After praising Allah, and this is how we begin an address. We praise Allah, we send salawat on the Prophet ﷺ, then Amma Ba'd, go on with whatever we had to say. When we make dua, first we praise Allah to the best of our ability. If you can't do it in Arabic, which are the best words, the verses of the Quran or the Sunnah du'as that we find, the Masnoon du'as that we find in the Sunnah, then 
in English, praise Allah, send salawat on the Prophet then make dua as you like. So, Amma Ba'd, فَإِنِّي أَدْعُوكُمَا بِدِعَايَةِ Islam. I invite you people with the invitation of Islam. Aslima Taslama. For those of you who know, who've been here the last few episodes, this is the crux. In a nutshell, this is the summary. This is the, the, the entire message of Rasulullah in two words. Aslim Taslam. Embrace Islam, you will be safe. You will be safe in this world, you will be saved from the eternal punishment and doom of the life hereafter. Aslim Taslam. And now because he's addressing two people, and this is the first letter of its kind, Aslima Taslama. So you too, i.e. Jafar and Abd, the sons of Jalandi, you too accept Islam, and you too, both of you, will indeed be saved. Salvation is yours. فَإِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَى النَّاسِ كَافَّةً لِأُنذِرَ مَنْ كَانَ حَيًّا وَيَحِقَّ الْقَوْلُ عَلَى الْكَافِرِينَ He says, I am the messenger of Allah to all of mankind. As Allah says in the Holy Quran, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا كَافَّةً لِلنَّاسِ بَشِيرٌ وَنَذِيرًا We sent you. Some prophets came to a certain nation. Some came to a certain tribe. Some came to a certain individual. In the Bani Israel, in one day alone, 70 of the prophets have been massacred. In one day. You can imagine how many prophets there must have been living during that time. The Bani Israel, the Jews, nuts, crazy people. One day alone, 70 of them were massacred. So, Rasulullah didn't come to a certain people. Certain, he came to all of mankind, universally, globally, from the day he was commissioned with Nubuwa until the day of Qiyamah. And then he says, لِأُنذِرَ So to warn he whose heart is living. مَنْ كَانَ حَيًّا The one who's living, in other words, the one whose heart is alive. So Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah radiallahu anhu, commander-in-chief, and general Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu against the Romans in after Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam's time during the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu his khilafa the battle of Yarmouk Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah radiallahu anhu asks Khalid ibn al-Walid tomorrow this is in the conquest of Sham the Muslim conquest of Syria he says tomorrow there's going to be 60,000 of them the Romans they've brought the peasants the farmers the good the bad everybody together to try to go against the, us the Muslims how many of us Khalid do you think we need Khalid radiallahu anhu said 60,000 of them I think we need 60 of us Abu Ubaidah said huh Khalid 60,000 how many of us he said I was being nice I think 30 of us should be enough we're living they're dead man kana hayyan man kana qalbuhu hayyan the one whose heart is alive. Those are the ones that we came to warn. He whose heart is dead, لَهُمْ قُلُوبْ لَا يَفْقَهُونَ بِهَا They have hearts, they don't work. Their hearts don't work. They are those hearts, may Allah save us, on which Allah has placed. وَعَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ خَتَمَ اللَّهُ وَعَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ Allah has sealed off their, may Allah save us. That's when you tell somebody, fear Allah, they tell you, brother, worry about yourself. Yeah. Or, you don't know what's in my heart. Anyways. So, man kana hayyan wa yahiqqa al-qawlu ala al-kafirin. And to let the disbelievers know that this Islam is going to prevail. You might think we're the underdog. You might think we're the ones that are, you know, scared or afraid. Allah's promise, wa kana haqqan alayna nasrul mu'mineen. It is incumbent upon us to help the believers. This promise is going to be fulfilled. We're here to warn you that if your heart is alive, accept it. If not, oh, good luck, because it is going to win. We will be triumphant, victorious in the winners at the end. So it's up to you to decide. If you two choose, you're great people, you're kings. This is beautiful about Rasulullah So when a person was great outside of Islam, Rasulullah treated him as such inside of Islam. If he was a big man, if he was a monarch or a king, Rasulullah and the Sahaba didn't say, ah, he was a big disbeliever. Now we're going to. No. His station, his status was upheld. Rasulullah said, You accept Islam. The same status that you enjoy now 
before Islam, you will continue to enjoy after Islam. But if you people choose to refuse, when abaytuma in taqarra bil Islam, fa inna malaka kuma or mulka kuma zailun an kuma. Remember, if you choose to refuse and don't accept, then whatever kingdom you have, it's gone. So we're giving you become a Muslim and retain your kingdom. Or don't become a Muslim and lose your kingdom too. وَخَيْلِي تَحِلُّ بِسَاحَتِكِمَا Basically, my horses, Rasulullah said, my cavaliers, those mounted on horses, they're right here. Like they're coming for you. If you choose to refuse, they're there. They're already mounted and waiting and ready. وَتَظْهَرْ نُبُوَّةِ عَلَى مُلْكِكُمَا And my nubuwa, my prophethood, is definitely going to prevail. It is going to spread. Is going to reach your lands, whether you like it or not. We're offering it to you nicely now, before it is m you are made by force, compulsion, to have to accept it. Nevertheless, this takes place now in the eighth year. So we just finished with the seventh, in the month of Dhul Qa'da. Month of Dhul Qa'da, Rasulullah dispatches this letter that I've just read the entire thing to you and translated it. He dispatches this letter with a great Sahabi by the name of Amr bin As. And if anybody knows who Amr bin As is, know this one thing about him and that's good. He was sent later on during the reign of Umar bin Khattab to conquer Egypt. And he comes to Egypt. And you know, for those of you who know, I mean, one of the greatest, one of the most, one of the greatest civilizations in the world is ancient Egypt. Ancient Egypt is a civilization because of the Nile River. There was a river, a source of life, and people started to live and live and grow. This is social studies in grade five and six. Ancient Greece, ancient China, ancient Rome, ancient Egypt, Mesopotamia, by the way, which is Baghdad in Iraq, is the oldest civilization in the world. And then there's uh, the Aztecs, Maya, and then there's one more. This Nile River, the people had a crazy practice. You know what it was? Every single year, the river would dry. It would go dry. And in order to get the river to start gushing water again, what these people would do, they would take a beautiful virgin girl, they would adorn her, make her up, decorate her with, in a very beautiful, attractive manner, and they would throw her inside. And the water would start to flow. So this was the people's practice, and this is what happened. When Amr ibn As came, he said, what on earth is going on? So he wrote a letter to Umar ibn Khattab, who's the Khalifa, Amir al-Mu'mineen in Medina Munawwara. He said, I've seen this crazy practice here. Umar ibn Khattab wrote two letters back. One of these letters was to Amr ibn As, the one who's taking this letter now. This is much earlier, whatever we're discussing, that happens during the time of Umar ibn Khattab. Umar ibn, uh, Umar, ibn, uh, Umar ibn Khattab anu, writes these two letters. One to Amr ibn al-As, in which he gives them the instructions that I'm writing a second letter that's attached to this first one. Take this one and throw it inside of the river. And what does that letter say? From Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar ibn Khattab to the river Nile. If you flow by the accord and permission of Allah, you better flow. And if not, we don't need you. Take this letter, Amr, and throw it in the water. Amr bin As receives the letter, the instructions of Umar bin Khattab, and he throws it in, and the water starts to flow. Not a single girl has ever, since that letter has reached Nile, ever been made to sacrifice again, and never once has the Nile run dry. Sahaba. Umar bin Khattab radiallahu So this is Amr bin Al-As. This is the fresh Amr bin As. The one we're talking about now. Not the one we just spoke about. That's going to happen later on. We're going to do that too. Inshallah. You know what we're going to do? We're going to finish the seerah. We're going to do Khilafah of Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali and Hassan. Then we're going to do Muawiyah and Yazid. We're going to do Abdul Malik ibn Maru. We're going to go all. And then you know everything they watch, watch, watch on Urtarul? Yeah, and then Uthman, we're going to do that whole thing, the real story though. Whatever they showed us. Urtrul, there's five pages written of him in Islamic history 
how did they make 40 episodes on Netflix with half of it's just them going through that, you know, the forest with that music playing and on horses? Anyways, so what happens? He, Amr ibn al-Asr radiallahu anhu, is fresh. He's just become a Muslim recently. This is the, Amr ibn al-As is the son of Ghas bin Wa'il. As bin Wa'il is macho man. He is a he is a dawn from the leaders of Quraysh in Mecca, the disbelievers. As bin Wa'il, what is one of the most esteemed of all of them. His son is Amr ibn al As. Amr ibn al As has just accepted Islam. He's already been sent out on a mission. Where to? To these two sons of the king of Amman. So, this letter from the Prophet ﷺ to the two sons of the king, Jalandi. So, Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu, he gets to Amman. When he gets to Amman, the first individual that he meets with is one of the sons by the name of Abd. His son, the, the name is, this individual's name is Abd. We normally know Abdullah, Abdul Rahman, Abdul Rahim. Two of the most beloved names to Allah are Abdullah and Abdul Rahman, by the way. Oh, Abdullah. Subhanallah. So, his name is Abd. He meets with Abd. Excuse me. He explains to Abd who he has sent him. Amr ibn al-As explains to him, I have come to you from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It is he who has sent me. Abd replies right away. And a lengthy discussion is about to take place between the two of them. He responds right away. He says, I know that man to be very forbearant, to be very tolerant, to be very, very good-mannered. He is praising Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's not a Muslim yet. Abd is praising him. So then, however, it wouldn't be possible for me to accept this message from you until you go and deliver this message to my brother because he's actually the supreme ruler himself. And if you wish for me to organize and to orchestrate a meeting between you and my older brother, then what we do in that case, I'll set up an imperial audience, like a, a lavish court for you, in which the both of you can meet, and the same letter that you presented to me, the same message with which you've come, you can present it to him as well. Abdan says, okay, what is it that you're inviting us to, by the way? You've brought us this letter from a man that's very great, forbearing, and good-mannered. What is it that you invite us to? Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu replies, We invite you to worship Allah and Allah alone. That you shun idolatry, that you don't do any shirk, you don't worship anybody or anything or any deity other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And that, of course, you believe in... Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the divine messenger of God. Abd says, okay. He says, you are the son of a chief. Your dad was a big man. So what was your father's reaction to all this? You're calling us. How would your father have reacted to this? We will react to what you're telling us in the same manner that your father would react. Hmm. So, Amr ibn As radiallahu anhu says, well, my father has moved on. He's passed on. He's already left this world. And sadly, he did not accept Islam. And this is my only wish, that he would have accepted Islam. As bin Wail was a very, very big man. But he didn't accept Islam. I was fortunate that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has Im allowed me to embrace Islam. He says, when did you embrace Islam? Abd asks him, Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu says, a few days ago. He's so convinced. Imagine this. Rasulullah Sassim is sending him to a king. He just became Muslim a few days ago. Wow. You know, Najashi, when he was given, when he was given the letter of Rasulullah Sassim, he said, thank you for the message. He said, yes. I knew he was going to come. I just didn't know he would be Arab from you people. And if I see him, I'll wash his feet. I would really like to meet him. When I see him, my yaqeen in him won't be increased in the least because it's already at the highest level. Najashi said this, Nigis, about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. These people are amazing. He says, where did you embrace Islam? He says, I've embraced Islam. Amr ibn al-As radiallahu said, I've embraced Islam at the hands of Najashi. 
when Najashi took the Muslims, the Sahaba, and offered them a safe haven to seek refuge from the persecution of the people in Mecca, Ja'far bin Abi Talib came and gave him the best, one of the greatest sermons in Islam. Ja'far who we were, we were crazy, we used to lick blood off the ground, we used to kill one another and fight like this. And then Rasulullah came to us and guided us, and amazing, one of the best khutbas was given by Ja'far After this, he accepted Islam. Najashi had already accepted Islam to try and lie to Najashi to get the Muslims to come back to Mecca so the Quraysh could persecute and punish them even more. The Quraysh sent Amr ibn al-As and Abu Sufyan. So Amr ibn al-As later on accepted Islam at the hands of this Najashi himself. So anyways, he says, I've accepted Islam at the hands of Najashi. He says, hold on a minute. Najashi? He says, yes, Najashi has also become a Muslim himself. He says, how did the people react to Najashi as becoming Muslim? He said, all of the people were on board with him and they did exactly what he did. The people with him of Abyssinia have also accepted Islam and followed him. He said, how about his other courtiers, the people around him, the great, the viziers and ministers? He says, no, they yielded. They didn't follow. He says, hold on. Think about what you're saying, Amr. I hope you're not speaking lies. Najashi accepted, sorry. The viziers, the ministers all accepted with him too. He accepted, his people have accepted, and what are you talking about? This individual, the son of Julandi, has no clue that all of this has already happened. He's not the first to be receiving this letter. Many kings have already received it. He says, hold on, I hope you're not speaking lies, because it's very repulsive to be speaking a lie. That's the last thing you'd want to do. Amr ibn al says, no, I don't speak a lie. I would have never spoken a lie to you. And it's not permissible in Islam for me to be speaking lies in the first place. Abdan asks him, okay, is Hirakal, the emperor of Rome, is he aware of Najashi's accepting Islam? Hirakal was the boss. Najashi used to pay tax to Hirakal. Hirakal in Rome, Najashi in Abyssinia. Najashi used to pay him tax. He says, Amr ibn al replies, Oh, Hirakul is well aware that Najashi has accepted Islam. He says, how do you know? He says, because as soon as he accepted Islam, Najashi swore, he took an oath in Allah's name, that he is never going to pay a single dirham to Hirakul in Rome again. He says, what? So now... The brother of Hirakal, his name was Nayaq. When he heard this information that Najashi is refusing to pay us tax and he's left our religion, they were staunch Christians, he's left our religion for another religion, is he just going to like walk off and that's it? Are we not going to punish him or are we not going to take him to task for this? Who does Najashi? He refers to him, Nayaq, the brother of Hirakul, refers to Najashi radiallahu anhu as the slave. Like this slave of yours think he's not going to be paying taxes anymore and he's going to just leave our religion and join another one. Hirakul replied to his brother, he says it's his choice. He has every right to leave any religion, to join any religion after leaving ours. He has the right. And as a matter of fact, if it wasn't for fear of my kingdom, I would have also joined the religion myself. Hirakla says this, but for those of us who know, he never embraced Islam, sadly. Anyhow, so back to the conversation. Abd then asks, okay, do you know what you're talking about, Amr? He says, I know very well, I'm telling you nothing but the truth. This man is shocked. Najashi accepted Islam, he became a boss, he refused to pay tax, and now Hirakul, and Hirakul also wanted to, but he couldn't because of his kingdom. He says, okay, what is it that your Nebi, that your prophet, the unlettered one, what is it that he encourages and commands, and what is it that he tells the people to refrain from doing? He tells him, Amr ibn al-Aswad replies, he commands the people to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not to disobey him. 
He commands the people to do good deeds and refrain from doing any bad deeds. And then he orders the people to maintain family ties of relationship and he refrains the people from cruelty, from transgression, adultery, zina, from consuming alcohol and committing shirk, associating partners with Allah and worshipping of the cross. All of these things are not allowed. Abd says, this seems like a very pleasant invitation. This is excellent counsel. Whatever you're telling me about him, this is wonderful. But the only thing is, I need my brother to agree. If my brother is to agree, then it would become very easy for me. Both of us would be able to go to the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and embrace Islam at his hands at once. Okay, Amr says, if he embraces Islam, your brother Jaifar, let him know that his kingdom will remain. He will still be a king. Rasulullah says, allow him to enjoy the status of being a king even after he embraces Islam. And what he will be given as a task, collecting rich, collecting riches from the rich, the wealth of the rich and the elite, the wealthy, and to take it and distribute, distribute that same wealth amongst the poor and the destitute. Abdan says, this is amazing. How much is it that is going to be taken from the people and how is it levied? How is it distributed? How is it the procedure for zakat? Amr ibn al relates, I explained everything to him. I told him, this is exactly how much is taken from gold. This is, it's called the nisab, the threshold. How much you need before you actually have to give the zakat for silver, for goats, for camels. I explained it all to him. After explaining it to him, then finally he dispatched me to go to his brother Jaifar. I came to his brother, the Supreme King. I gave him the sealed letter that Rasulullah had dispatched me with. He opens the letter, he breaks the seal on the letter and he begins to read the letter of Rasulullah He asks me to sit down. Jaifar asks Amr ibn al-As to sit down. After he sits down, he asks me Amr ibn al-As narrates, he started to ask me about the Quraysh. So I told him about the Quraysh. Whatever I knew about the Quraysh, I shared with him. One day or two days, he asked me to give him respite to think over the matter. After two days, he came back to me and said that I'm also inclining to the same religion that my brother has inclined to. After this, both of the sons of the king of Amman became Muslim and many others followed their suit, followed the same path as they did. Those who refused to accept Islam, they were forced to pay the indemnity tax under which the Muslims basically offer them protection and they have to pay. So Hafid ibn Hajar Asqalani rahimahullah says, yes, this was probably the king who was the real king, the father, sorry, who was the real king. He may or may not have been addressed by Rasulullah in this letter. In another narration, the story goes like this. Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu, when he came with this letter to Abd and Jaifar, the two brothers, he actually gave a little message to them. He said to them that you may be far from us geographically, but you are definitely not far from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and don't take anybody as partner unto him. And don't worship the one that you think is to be partnered with Allah because Allah has absolutely no partner. Life was given to you by Allah and death was also given to you by Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you inception, you came into existence from him, and it is unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you will have to return. You need to go back and think about this unlettered prophet who has sent me to you with this letter. It is him who has brought goodness to us. He brought goodness to us, he presented to us the success of this life as well as the life hereafter. And I tell you, this is the disclaimer, if he asks you for anything for himself, you don't even give it to him. That's when you know this person is fishy. Like half of the people that claim whatever they claim in the world, they only do it for money. It's so difficult to find a reliable source. Whether you go for ruqya, whether you go for whatever, people just want money. That's the first sign. The man, Amr ibn al who says, if he asks you for money, cut. You know right off the bat that this is fishy business. You don't even have to listen to him. You have nothing to do with him. If he's got any nafsani, any of his own personal desires that he's looking to fulfill, disown him, abandon him. This is my disclaimer to you. You, have, you take it from me. And then after this, Amr ibn al-As says, you really need to both think, think, ponder, contemplate 
over this religion that he has presented to us. Does this religion that he has come to us with, does it resemble any one of these man-made laws or religions or faiths that you people know of? Does it? Does this Islam that he has come to us with, presented to us, is it similar to any other man-made religion? If not, then you know for a fact that this is divine religion of God. This is the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then know that indeed you should definitely follow it. Do what it tells you to do, this Nabi, what he tells you, and refrain from doing anything that he warns us about. This was given, this address by Amr ibn al to the father in this narration. How did he reply? He responded by saying, I've thought very deeply about the unlettered Prophet, Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and I've found in him a remarkable quality that whenever he enjoins anything on anyone, he is the first to practice it and carry it out himself. Whenever, and the Sahaba saw this before they embraced Islam and they loved this. I believe it was Abdullah bin Salam radiallahu when he came to Medina, the Jew. He said, I saw this in the Prophet Anything that he told the people to do, he was the first to practice what he preached. And similarly, anytime he forbid anyone from doing anything, the first to refrain from that action was the Prophet ﷺ himself. Anytime he was victorious and triumphant, he never gloated. And anytime he was defeated, this happened, he never became agitated. And he fulfills his promise and he honors his word. And we conclude, then Julandi recited a couple of lines to Amr ibn al anhu and embraced Islam by saying that I testify that he is indeed the messenger of Allah. He said, Atani amrun billati laysa ba'daha min al-haqqi shay'un wa nasihu nasihu fa ya amr qad aslamtu lillahi jahratan yunadi biha fil wadayni fasihu. He says, Amr came to me, Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu came to me with, with that after which, like this is the truth, after which there's absolutely no other truth. This is the truth, and the one who wished well for me has indeed wished well for me. Referring to Amr ibn al-As, he says, O oh, Amr, I have indeed accepted Islam for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sake openly. And if people want, they can go and announce this publicly to everybody that I, Julandi, the king of Amman, has become a Muslim. Inshallah, we'll continue next Tuesday. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdika, nashadu wa la ilaha 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 